Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Warriors Corner for the presentation on driving capabilities to the war. Today's speakers will be Brigadier, Ger Brigadier General Brian Gibson, Director, Air and Missile Defense CFT, and Mr. Daryl Colvin, Deputy Program Executive Officer for Missiles in Space. As a reminder, during the question and answer portion, please wait until you have the microphone in your hand before asking your question. And also, so for everyone's awareness, there are links to archive presentations from the Warriors Corner at the black table in the rear. At this time, let's welcome Brigadier General Gibson and Mr. Colvin. Thanks. All right, well, good morning, everybody. Hopefully you can hear me. And um, I apologize, I'm not a Washington Nationals fan, but I probably should be after last night. Um, and I'm not a Green Bay Packers fan. I probably should be after last night. So if you had any of those two things that you had in your history last night to watch, they were awesome to watch. Um, and I think you saw two great examples of what winning looks like. And you've probably heard from our secretary, you've probably heard from our chief, you've heard from others that what we do in our Army is we win. And we're in a, we're in a place now, we're in a critical place now where we must continue to win. It's because of teammates, it's because of partnerships, it's because of industry, it's because of our four national partners. My partner to my left, uh, my battle buddy, is Mr. Daryl Colvin. His um, boss, Major General um, Rash, unfortunately couldn't be here this week. But between the acquisition community and the requirements community, at least in my career, I've never seen an environment where the teamwork comes together between two different organizations with two different responsibilities. So you're going to hear equally from Daryl here in a little while also from the acquisition perspective of what we do. It's a privilege to be here. I'm the Air Defense Cross-Functional Team Lead. Some of you I've met, some of you I haven't. I look forward to your questions at the end of this as we um, spend a little time together first in the shoot this morning to talk about what's on the horizon for air defense. So before I get into the briefing, I think there's three important things that matter to air defense to allow the Army to win. Three things. And if the, if the air defense community doesn't achieve these three things, our Army doesn't succeed in the future. The first thing is it's to protect our maneuver forces. And you've probably seen over here on the floor our most recent short-range air defense vehicle that we are bringing to bear in capability, the Intermediate Interim Maneuver Shorad Vehicle. The second priority that matters to us to win is that we have to protect the fixed and semi-fixed assets above the maneuver formations. Think about core and division headquarters. Think about logistics locations. Think about critical locations on the battlefield, whether they be river crossings, whether they be other locations that matter to allow the maneuver to occur. We have to equally protect those locations to win. And then lastly, and probably the most important thing that we have to accomplish as a force, is we have to converge our capabilities to create windows of opportunity for the joint force. Army Air Defense, is a part of the joint force, just like every other capability in our Army. But because of our capabilities from space to mud, we operate many times in direct support of our joint partners at echelons at the strategic level and the operational level. So those three things, if we accomplish those, we win and we allow the Army to succeed in multi-domain operations and large-scale combat operations. So if you could bring up the first chart, please. Inside of our cross-functional team, next slide, please. We have four main lines of effort. And those three things I told you a few minutes ago about what matters for winning for Army Air Defense are embedded in these four lines of effort. And those four lines of effort span mission command or command and control for air defense. They span some maneuver formations and capabilities. They span capabilities that allow the maneuver to occur and they span new sensors. So those four things are in priority order for us as an air defense force and us for our Army. Our mission command capability in the future can no longer be one, two, three different types of mission command platforms. 
It has to be the same platform, it has to be the same capability, and it has to be across the breadth and depth of the battlefield to allow us to converge. The second priority is our maneuver shore at or protecting our maneuver forces. Our adversaries, especially those potentially on the plains of Europe or elsewhere, know that our heavy division forces and our land forces must be protected. And that's why we're bringing back the striker base variant that you see today. Our third priority on there that you see is the indirect fire protection capability. That's intended to provide the protection above the maneuver formations for a little bit broader range of threats. It's not just about the low and slow things that we expect to occur inside of the tactical formations. But it also, we should be making sure that we employ our capabilities with the best cost and capability ratios that we can. And that allows us to accomplish that in the future. The fourth priority in order is our replacement radar for Patriot. This radar will operate at the operational and strategic levels, but most importantly with this radar, and you'll see this as a theme from Daryl and I, not only today, but you'll see it as a theme for air defense, is that no longer are we in the business of building a standalone weapon system. No longer can we afford to build a weapon system that can't talk to anybody else. No longer can we have weapon systems that are tied from the missile to the radar. No longer can we have weapon systems that don't interoperate and integra integrate across our air defense and our army and our joint force. So this is a standalone sensor. And this is the first sensor inside of our air defense platform that will allow us to do things differently. When coupled with a mission command system that takes advantage of standalone components and capabilities, you can start operating in much more flexible, distributed, efficient, and effective methods. So then you can pair the best sensor with the best shooter, with the best mission command capability at the right time and the right place. And that's why it's so important in our strategy as we move forward for the Army and for our joint force is to take a critical eye on those technologies that allow us to do that. And whether it be advanced machine interface type applications in the future, or whether that be a, a sensor like you see on the bottom of this chart, every place in the future where we seek to achieve success and dominance will be at the component level. Where we can't achieve that, we'll take it back to weapon system as needed. But our first and foremost priority is to get the command and control straight, then plug in capabilities where we need them across the battlefield. Next chart, please. Some of you have may have seen this, it's a little bit busy chart, but the purpose of this chart is to demonstrate that your air defense force, your army, you know this, operates at all echelons, operates from the strategic to the tactical. And there's no silver bullet. There never has been, there never will be. We've sought to try and find silver bullets in the past for all the right reasons. But we've, saw, we've seen that that practice has been unaffordable. It can't counter the range of threats across the breadth of the battlefield that you have to counter. So our strategy continues to um, unfold in a layered and tiered approach. And we'll continue to do that. Whether it be the introduction of advanced capabilities at the tactical leading edge with directed energy that you may see up there on the slide with the 50 kW laser inside of our short range air defense force in the future. Or whether that may be a little bit more powerful lasers above that point or whether it be above that with our existing capabilities that we seek to replace with Patriot and improve with THAAD. They're all brought together, and they have a particular mission, a task, and a purpose that we seek to maximize. So the purpose of this is to, regardless of where we find ourselves on the battlefield, regardless of, regardless of what our warfighters need, is to be there is to be there with the right thing at the right place. It's an exciting time for air defense. I've been doing it a long time and with much of your help, many friends in the, in the audience. I've never seen such activity inside the air defense portfolio over the past three decades of what I see now. And it's because of your effort. We remain a priority for the Army. It matters, but what matters most is we don't stop the momentum. If we stop it now, all of our hard efforts over the last, especially last two years, but over the last three decades are in vain. 
And we're just starting this now. Resources matter, priorities matter, relationships matter with industry. But for us to achieve what we seek to achieve in support of our Army, we've got to continue to get these capabilities to the field. And right now, over the next two years, every single one of those capabilities on the previous chart joins the United States Army. Think about that. Four major activities all simultaneously being introduced to our force. When was the last time that's happened to Army Air Defense? I'll give you a hint, it never has. So that's why I'm excited, that's why I'm passionate about what we do. Because for our Army, air defense absolutely is one of the paths that lead to our future success in multi-domain operations. So I, that's why today, in many other environments, I'll continue to ask your support. This isn't the finish. This is the start. That's only increment one. Increment two, initial capability. There will be more. But that's a necessary first step as we move forward, as we go into achieving the capabilities in the future. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to um, Daryl to take us through a little bit more on the acquisition side. And then we'd be happy to answer your questions you have um, at the end. So, Daryl, please. So I'm going to focus on two things in, in our discussion. One is the relationships uh, that we have. So our relationship with uh, the AMD CFT, the Army Futures Command, relative to modernization is key to everything we do. It's about that teamwork. I'm going to, I'm going to talk about one signature system that uh, Gen General Gibson uh, laid out for you, talk about its success story, at the speed of relevance, which I define as at the speed of the soldier, from concept to warfighting capability in the hands of the warfighter. And we're going to talk through that with the, the uh, initial M. Shorad concept that you've seen uh, uh, on the floor over here. The other piece I want to talk about is how we realign, uh, take that one step further, realign the capabilities uh, that our partners are, have prioritized with the, amongst those 31 signature systems across the PEO's portfolio to be much more responsive, to be much more flexible, to, to break down the barriers of integration and interoperability and provide the warfighter what they need at the speed of the soldier. Go ahead, next chart. What's interesting is I've got one of my, uh, one of my mentors uh, and, and uh, an individual that I look up to and respect uh, is the Honorable Kevin Fahey, who's the Assistant Secretary of Defense uh, for acquisition. Uh, Mr. Fage trained me uh, and told me for years, Daryl, it's all about the acquisition piece. If you have a requirement, funding, and decisions, acquisition can do anything. One of the things that our relationship and the teamwork between the AMD CFT and the other CFTs that, that uh, we work with uh, has borne out is we take those three requirements, requirements, funding, and decisions, and through the teamwork uh, with our supporting element through the CFTs, we have direct access up to the Army senior leadership for quick determination and approval of the requirements, for quick decisions on the funding, and quick decisions on that's the operational requirement, that's the capability we want on the field. The IM Shorad is one of the acceleration uh, success stories uh, that we share. February of 2017 was when this was really born, <laughs> talking about who can build this. We had a requirement, a gap, identified uh, by our AMD CFT that said we need, we need solutions quickly to close this uh, gap for our maneuver forces. Sources sought issued in February of 2017. And you can read across and look at the timelines, but look at the time from sources sought which was what can industry do for us, to the down select in the June timeframe of 2018 and contract award, the subsequent contract award in September of 2018. I'm happy to say that first, uh, all the vehicles right now are in play, ready for test. You saw one over here uh, on display. Uh, we have one at Redstone Arsenal that entered testing last week. It was delivered, we're ready to go. So think about that from the speed of relevance, from, uh, from the sources sought all the way through delivery of the system, just over two years. 
that is very fast for a major weapon system like the IM Shorad. So our lesson learned, uh, we engaged with industry early. Uh, I, I started uh, the, the process I was in the initial meeting uh, with our acquisition senior leadership uh, on can we do a demonstration? Can we br have in ask industry to bring what they, what they, uh, they have within uh, their capacities and demonstrate capabilities for the maneuver force against certain threat sets? That, uh, that uh, really that proof of principle and that experimentation and testing uh, led to industry partnerships, communications that were two-way, which, which were critical in order to resolve issues up front, solve problems, because that's one thing that we pride ourselves on with this relationship. It's all about the solutions. So we didn't let any one issue slow us down. And we we're willing to trade. We we're willing to look at the trade space Look at, look at the operational risks and say, we can assume those drive. So it was a continuous discussion of requirements, capabilities, and technical solutions. We didn't get uh, locked down into one solution mentality. Uh, when we did the, the initial uh, demonstrations out of White Sands, we asked industry to bring whatever they could. And we had a lot of different solutions that we were able to look at. Leveraging the existing systems in the Army inventory allowed us to focus very quickly on not uh, getting bogged down in brand new developments, but looking at the, the means to integrate existing capabilities, which resulted in uh, the IM Shore platforms that you see on the floor here and those that are already into test. So taking this one step further, this is a, a, an acquisition success story uh, really tied to the teamwork established between the requirements the funding and the decisions. I can't harp on that any, any, anymore. That is an extremely important element of everything that we're doing today. So we took that one step forward and we said, what about alignment of capabilities, which you saw the, the four priorities that uh, General Gibson laid out. How do we align those within the portfolio today within our program executive office? Can you go to the next chart? So today, uh, it's, I know this is, is kind of hard to read, but Within uh, the PEO Missiles in Space portfolio today, just over 34 programs perfectly aligned within the centers of excellence that they support, whether it's the Fire Center of Excellence at Fort Sill, Maneuver at Fort Benning, Aviation at Fort Rucker, or Air Defense in Space uh, at Redstone Arsenal with SF Space and Missile Defense Command. Each of the, each of the uh, centers of excellence with the requirements that they're asking the programs to fulfill, the programs are doing very well. The challenge that we looked at was how do we align uh, the, the portfolio today to better meet the requirements for multi-domain operations? So our focus was, uh, as, we're, as we're set up today, are we, are we integrated and are we interoperable? Two key elements that the AFC and modernization require in order to fight and win in a multi-demand battle. Next chart. So we looked at, are we really optimized for success? Uh, General Gibson made mention, and I'm gonna focus on uh, the, the fire control solution. We, what we did is we mapped out our portfolio and the capabilities across the multi-domain battle. From where we are today in Compete, through our anti-access and area denial um, uh, mission set to defeat that threat, to penetrate it, disintegrate it, find areas of weakness and, weakness and gaps, and then allow our maneuver forces to exploit it and defeat on the objective to put us back into a recompete posture with our, with our uh, uh, near peer adversaries. So what we did is we looked at, at for example, mission command, fire control solutions, we're really being satisfied by three different project management offices. All were working different mission command elements. Our, our radars and sensors were, working, were being worked by three different project offices, if you could, as you see on the top. What that meant was, as the requirements were coming in from the centers of excellence, they were being flowed down into our project offices to be uh, addressed and for material solutions. But from an efficiency perspective, we weren't leveraging the key technologies across the industrial base to get at the best solution possible. So what we did is, is we said, uh, what is the best way to align 
across uh, the, the uh, portfolio relative to multi demand operations. Go to the next chart. And what we, what we found out was uh, if we align, for example, uh, fires, radars, and sensors, a single commodity manager, project manager, to manage fires, radars, and sensors across the MDO battle space, we can be much more flexible, efficient, and responsive to the warfighter, looking at those solutions that can detect, identify, classify, and discriminate, rather than having individual standalone uh, sensors to, com to complete that. We can look at uh, what technologies can we apply to our sensor base in order to be most effective. Same thing with integrated fires and mission command. One mission command providing the fire controls, control solution. Uh, converging, aligning those capabilities into one architecture to be very efficient across all things integrated air missile defense to allow now components, to allow a sensor to be pulled into that architecture, to allow a, an AMD fires uh, interceptor and launcher to be pulled into that architecture to allow for defensive or offensive fires capabilities. So at the, as we laid this out, what we found was by going through the alignment of these capabilities in accordance with the multi-domain operations, we were able to, to start laying the foundation to solve the problem. That's what the, that's what, uh, the AFC is all about. Army Futures Command is really driving solutions the solution uh, to solving the problem of alignment of capabilities to achieve desired outcomes across warfighter functions and multiple domains is finding that architecture that aligns offensive and defensive fires on the battlefield. What a game changer relative to integration and interoperability, not only for the US systems, the Army systems, but for the joint systems on the battlefield as well. Next chart. So at the end of the day, uh, what, we, what we've done is we really haven't changed the product lines. The products are the commodities fulfilling the capability sets. What we did is we realigned or are looking at realigning those, com those products with those capabilities into fires, radars, and sensors, the mission command elements, air missile defense fires, operations and strategic fires, and then aviation and ground fires. Integrating and interoperating offensive and defensive fires capabilities. So I appreciate the, the time to address you today. Uh, General Gibson and I will, will open it up for questions. Okay, Th thanks Daryl. Um, just, I, I, I know the questions come, so what really's changed Army, right? What really are you doing? Are you just changing organizations? Are you just trying to build things faster? Yes, 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 and more yes to the end of that. We are absolutely doing all of that with an eye on getting past our overmatch that we see today. And we know it takes all of that. We know it takes changed organizations inside of the acquisition community. We know it takes different requirements, processing timelines from the user community. We know it takes different ability to speed things at something less than the gold-plated 100% standard and be that good enough to incrementally upgrade it later. But none of this is possible without people. And none of it's possible without the relationships that hopefully you've seen today that has demonstrated, first of all, we're on the same team and we're on the same message. But more importantly, we're on the same future and we're striving to achieve the same thing. And with your help from industry, from our partners, we will. But as I said it earlier, this is the beginning, not the end. 18 months from requirement to a piece of metal on a floor is awesome. But that's only the awesome first step. We've got more in front of us. It's an exciting time for air defense. And I think over the next two to four years, you'll see the greatest change in, inside of this branch, and inside of our capabilities that you've ever seen in the history of the United States Army Air Defense Corps. And it's interesting, in 1968, air defense split from the Field Artillery Corps 50 years ago. And we find ourselves today talking about offensive and defensive fires integration 50 years later. But that's what's upon us. That's our future. 
We look forward to whatever questions you may have, please. Uh, sir, a as uh, the Army turns to optimize uh, for uh, great power competition, a number of countries, including China, have uh, demonstrated the ability to take out their own satellites in space. Uh, clearly, our uh, air and missile defense and uh, a whole array of other systems depend upon these space-based sensors. Uh, what does the uh, portfolio look like for uh, defending the space-based sensor layer? So, there are lots of... Um, and it's just not the one country you mentioned. There's, it's, you rightfully point out that space is the frontier that we must defend, we must protect, we must modernize for not only our success, but the success of our partners. It's more than a single capability. It's a combination of capabilities, whether those be upgraded and modernized, new satellites, whether that be increased capabilities on the Army Air Defense defensive side of life, the Joint Force has a big part to play in this for capability development as well, but it's the combination of all of those things put together that achieve you something different than what we have today. Um, you often hear our leadership speak of space and cyber are the domains no longer of ours alone and probably where the first shot is fired um, in our future fight. So we are keen on our capabilities for getting after the advanced threats. That's one of them. There are several others. But you just can't develop a missile normally to do one, to solve one piece of an advanced threat. You normally just can't develop a sensor to handle one piece of the threat. You normally can't develop one mission command application to handle a piece of that. It is everything brought together, converged um, in support of what we do to get after the defense of that threat. You have anything to add on yours, Terrell? So on the, re on the requirements piece, General Gibson hit it hit pretty well. When you look at how, as, we, as you start aligning capabilities, okay, it's about how you're allocating those requirements. So in the past, as requirements came down, we went, would go to a specific project office and we'd ask for a solution. Okay? Uh, at the end of the day, uh, what we're finding is by, by looking at how, how the, what problem we're trying to solve, what capability we're asked to address, the requirements that we need to satisfy don't necessarily mean we go to a single system and say do it all. We're looking across the spectrum for the Army systems, as you see them here in components, as well as the joint uh, capabilities in order to solve those problems, which really get at the addressing the threat that you're talking about. Thank you. Any other questions? Hey, sir. Uh, so in looking towards the future and uh, looking at, you know, competing with near-peer adversaries, you know, one of the things that the U.S. kind of lags behind, right, lags behind is EW. And, you know, we look at, like, some of our near-peer adversaries and they're completely integrated. And while, you know, I see, you know, this integration of, like, fires and stuff being great, where are we at as far as EW and what is the concern with that? Uh, so EW is absolutely essential to account for to integrate and um, not only at the platform level but organizationally above that um, for not only air defense but for our Army. As an example inside the air defense portfolio what we're doing, we are very attuned to and our future requirements for onboard capability to operate in the EW environment. And um, that matters at the platform level significantly where perhaps it wasn't as unique a requirement in the past. Um, but it's not just being able to defend, operate, um, compete in that environment at the platform level. You've got to have the ability to, um, on the intelligence side of life and also on the maneuver side of life, to be able to share information um, so you can enable the competition to occur at the platform level. So for air defense, um, inside of our new sensors specifically, we are absolutely focused on what it takes um, to operate in that space. And it, sometimes it may be more power. Sometimes it may be operating differently. Sometimes it may be don't turn your radars on, right? It's about getting the information from others so you can take advantage of your converged capabilities versus having the inherent disadvantages perhaps at the individual platform level that aren't converged. Any comments on it? Yeah, so we look at it not just from an EW perspective, uh, we're looking at uh, the ability to operate in denied environments. 
to include cyber, EW, and Assure PNT. So we have uh, amongst the, the uh, uh, cross-functional teams uh, that we work very closely with, uh, the Assured uh, Position Navigation and Timing team, uh, led by uh, Mr. Willie Nelson, who's that CFD director. We work very closely with him as well, relative to be able to survive in those operationally denied environments so they can fight through it, as we've described with the re relative to the multi-domain operations from compete all the way through to, to get back to a recompetitive mode. And so it's all of the above. And if I could just highlight what Daryl said, that's, a, that's an important point, right? All of us, when we create new organizations, there's a tendency, human nature, to allow um, stovepipes to occur when you create those. That is absolutely not what occurs inside of at least the cross CFTs and across our Army. We're intentional about it. Our leadership is intentional about it. We have hooks and ties to our capabilities being developed that are dependent to converge across all the different capabilities. So it's, a, it's an important point to re-highlight that teamwork just doesn't go lateral between the acquisition community and the CFT for each of our portfolios. It's across our army if we're going to win this thing. And um, it's those 31 signature systems you've heard our leadership talk about where our primary focus is. Good, thanks. Any other questions? Uh, General, thank you very much. I appreciate your capability-based uh, realignment. That's no small uh, accomplishment already. Would you, uh, either of you gentlemen, care to comment a little bit about the interrelationship between the PEO and the Missile Defense Agency as an example, now that you're aligned by capabilities? Yeah, I'll turn it over to, thank you, I'll turn it over to Daryl here to answer the remainder of this. I just offer a couple things first. Um, what Missile Defense Agency does on behalf of the Department of Defense is essential. And for our Army, many of you know, Oftentimes, those are capabilities that get developed and then, at times, are transitioned to services at the appropriate time and at the appropriate level with resources. But without an organization at OSD level, it then becomes a service opportunity or a service problem to try and replicate the power that OSD can bring through the Missile Defense Agency for our, really, our strategic capabilities. And quite frankly, our most advanced threats that we're trying to counter in the future we can't do it alone, and it has to be done with their help. Um, so they're absolutely essential as a teammate in the DOD environment, um, and it's a pretty close relationship. It hasn't changed. But, Daryl, if you want to comment on the relationship any further? If you could go back one chart. So w with respect to our relationship with, it, with Missile Defense Agency, it, it, you can't discount the relationship with Space and Missile, Def uh, Space and Missile Defense Command as well. Having those, those three elements, uh, and we're being centrally located at Redstone Arsenal, our external stakeholders are within arm's reach. So we spend a good portion of our, of our time not only working with the Army uh, Futures Command and their, and their related uh, cross-functional teams, we spend a lot of time working with Missile Defense Agency and Space and Missile Defense Command to get uh, down from the warfighter, from the operational and ta tactical, all the way to the strategic. So as you look at the MDO capabilities, they apply across the battle space to include Missile Defense Agency. So as we think through radar, fires, radar sensors, the Integrated Mission Command, fires, uh, we're, we're very eager and we stay connected to what uh, capabilities Missile Defense Agency brings from a homeland per defense perspective, from FAD, from Aegis, because all of those are uh, ISR assets, all of those are uh, uh, mission command elements that feed into integrated mission command in order to be able to have a single integrated air picture and to be able to fight uh, with our IMD fires to take out uh, the smallest group one uh, UA UASs and commercial uh, systems that are out there out to the uh, to the tactical ballistic missiles and higher that are that are coming over the horizon so very close and direct relationship uh, not only between uh, the CFTs and the AFC, but as well with uh, uh, Space and Missile Command, Missile Defense Command, and Missile Defense Agency. Yeah, it's really a it's really a triangle of equality. Equality gives different people different opinions, but at the end of the day, it's about the relationship in that triangle, where most of these capabilities either develop, transition, or reside, um, and then we field to the force. So it's a they're an equal partner, and um, just like SMDC is as Daryl talked about, can't be done without any of those partners together. 
Yes, sir. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Any other questions? Hey, good morning. Uh, Fred Fagan with White Space Innovations. I was just curious about the directed energy portion of the intermediate or interim maneuver shore ad vehicle. And uh, I guess what is what is the biggest concern you have technically, contractually? Uh, what is, what what are you afraid of uh, regarding getting that uh, capability fielded and uh, in the in the soldiers' hands? Thank you. Yeah. So I'm not afraid of anything. Somebody else said that. I'm not sure who, but um, what. We have to get new capabilities as soon as we can to the field. It's, it's a reality. Our overmatch dictates it. Our environment dictates it. Directed energy is one of those. Lasers as a subset of directed energy is really the, at the tip of um, where we're trying to go right now. There are other capabilities in there. Lasers for years, with all of us in this room, probably could say everybody's been talking about lasers for decades. Right? And whether that was inside of the Army or it was inside of the Joint Force, we've been talking about it. We're at the point to, we're not talking, we're doing. And over the next couple years, we remain committed to get a laser on that platform at the 50 kW level. Physics gets a vote. Right? Size, weight, and power always matter. It's the trade-off between those three. But I know what failure looks like. Failure looks like not putting it on one vehicle and then having another support vehicle with it to make it work. Failure looks like it's less than the power you need to take down the threats you're trying to counter. I also know what success looks like. Success is not only the reverse of that, but it's upping the power based on that capability to counter a broader range of threats above just that platform. And there's other capabilities I know many of you are very familiar with, not only inside the air defense portfolio, but inside of the broader portfolio where we seek to achieve and bring lasers to the battlefield. I'm very excited about it in this portfolio. It won't replace one for one any of our effectors we have today, but it will certainly be a game changer should we achieve the technology that is promised to allow us to have a choice and to have a different choice, whether it be cost and capability against an increasing range of threats. Darryl. So I talked, when I first started, I talked about the, uh, the speed of relevance and the speed to the soldier. This is a great example. Uh, so with the directed energy systems, we're working very closely with the Rapid Capabilities and Critical Technology Office, led by Lieutenant General Thurgood and his team. At the PEO level, we have transition teams embedded, operationally controlled by the RCCTO in their team. And they do two functions. One, they're assisting with the development of that system and fielding of that system uh, to the Army. The second is they're thinking through all the steps to transition that technology and that effort into a, uh, an office of primary responsibility within PEO Missiles in Space so we can continue through the developmental aspects and work all the illities associated with fielding that to, to the Army in, in quantity. So it's, it's, it's a, another element of that relationship uh, where we've really done a good job of thinking through from the concept all the way through uh, the material solution in the hands of the warfighter and all the, the Dotlam PFP domains associated with doctrine, organizational training, logistics, et cetera, to make that a reality within our Army. Uh, you asked about uh, what, what, uh, what are we most afraid of? I, I think that fear is gone. The fear used to be, what are we doing? Now we're doing. We've got an RCCTO in place. We've got transition teams working directly with them. We're ready to accept that technology and transition it into an, uh, a program or record and drive that into the hands of the soldiers. Cool. Okay, I th we're about out of time. I just want to say thank you as we, we end this. Your relationship matters. Hopefully you've heard that not only inside of our Army but across our Joint Force, it's a partnership that gets us to success. Winning matters. Inside of this portfolio, you're seeing it over the next couple years all come together at the same time. And um, it's an exciting time to be a soldier, an exciting time to be an air defender. And um, we look forward to our continued discussions with each of you. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you.